Good morning. I'm Fergus Hansen, one of the two research directors here at ASPE, and uh, I run the International Cyber Policy Centre here. Welcome to this very special ASPE event with Will Cathcart, the CEO of WhatsApp. Uh, thanks, Will. Uh, a company that counts over a quarter of the world's population as customers and has only had its 12th birthday. I'm fairly certain that uh, Will's work would have touched everyone listening in uh, today at least once. When he was at Facebook, he led product development for Newsfeed, um, and in 2018 was the vice president of the Facebook app where he oversaw the development and strategy for all Facebook app products, including video, groups, marketplace, Newsfeed, stories, and many more. Uh, before joining Facebook, Will worked at Google and was responsible for a product uh, for product development uh, of anti-spam technologies uh, for Google's products, including Gmail, a product I'm particularly grateful for. Um, Will, it's an absolute pleasure to have you with us uh, this morning, and can I thank everyone who is joining this for spending your time with us as well. I'll shortly hand over to Will to make some opening remarks. We'll then uh, dive into a discussion together before opening up to your questions. Um, so please get those questions ready. Uh, please vote up other people's questions that you really like, and I'll do my very best to get through as many of them as possible. Uh, so with that, um, can I pass over to you, Will, to, to make some opening remarks? Yeah, of course. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Thank you, Fergus, so much for hosting me and doing this. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm Will Cathcart from uh, the WhatsApp team. Um, you know, and I just really wanted to to talk about. And I think it was really a better time to talk about what's going on with WhatsApp uh, in particular and private messaging more generally. Um, you know, I, I don't need to tell everyone this, but we're increasingly living our lives digitally, and COVID has accelerated that. Um, you know, this event is proof of that. I, I cannot be in Australia. We cannot be meeting live. We're all meeting over the internet, um, and that's the way we've been living our lives off and on for the last year plus. Um, and, you know, today we talk to our loved ones, our friends, we talk to our doctors, we work, we learn, we buy things all digitally. We share personal information, we share health information, we share credit card information. And the more this happens, the more there is to protect. Um, in the space of messaging, the way we think about it as WhatsApp is that it, human beings, we're wired that when we talk to someone one-on-one -on -one, or when we talk to a small group of people, we expect that to be private. We don't think about whether or not there's going to be a record of what we said that comes out later. Our social behavior reflects this. Um, and this is how people use messaging. They message not thinking, okay, there's going to be a record of what I say. And so that's why we at WhatsApp are committed to using the best possible technology and end encryption to prevent anyone, including us, including Facebook, from seeing your private messages. Um, and end-to-end -end encryption is so effective that at this point, it's become the global standard. Um, across financial services, across healthcare, governments use it, technology. Most private messages sent around the world today are encrypted. Um, and we, you know, this is relevant because we've seen increasingly a number of governments intensifying pressure on tech companies, on industry, asking to develop backdoors to encryption, citing unbelievably good reasons like child safety, terrorism, and thinking that there must be some way to do this without weakening the security of end-to-end -end encryption. Um, there are legitimate questions about what safety looks like in an end-to-end -end encrypted environment, um, but a backdoor is not the way to solve them. I am confident that if there is a backdoor, criminals, hackers, financial fraudsters, and increasingly hostile governments will find ways to exploit it. I know that is a, a very unsatisfying answer. Everyone wants a solution that solves for the good and prevents the bad but I'm confident it's the honest answer. We have ways we can address safety concerns. We can talk more about this, but WhatsApp uses limited categories of information that we have, like unencrypted information or metadata. And we work with law enforcement, both to keep people safe without the need to collect a copy and access people's private messages. We use a range of techniques from machine learning to making it really easy for people to report or block other users. Um, we, we, we use a bunch of different techniques to detect child exploitative imagery. Um, we, we actually report quite a lot to the National, Setting of Mission, National Center for Missing and Exploited Children in the US, which then liaises all around the world. 
Um, and we use metadata as just law enforcement. Some private messaging platforms have deliberately designed their services to do none of this, to make all of this impossible. That's not our goal. Our goal is to give everyone the safety and security that comes with end-to-end -end encryption, and then do sophisticated things on top of that to address safety concerns as well. Um, I, I believe collaboration between government, industry, civil society, and academic experts is even more vital to figure out the right approach here and the right balance. Um, because different stakeholders see different bits of the puzzle. Um, you know, the, the, the piece I see is how important encryption will be, particularly end-to-end -end encryption, in our lives as more and more of our lives become digital and as there's more threats online um, with hackers, foreign governments, hostile actors trying to come after our information. So I believe policymakers must embrace the technology that helps keep their citizens' communications secure, um, given the growing cyber threats. So I'm very interested to dive deeper into some of the areas that are particularly interesting to you. Um, I know there have been many interesting public debates about encryption uh, and would love to hear your take on the conversations as, uh, too. Um, and again, thank you for doing this, Fergus. Thanks for taking the time. Great. Well, um, thank you so much for those uh, opening remarks, Will, and, and for your time today. Um, let me just maybe start with a couple of framing questions that deal with the geopolitics and some of the big um, broader international issues that we're grappling with here. So one of them, I guess, is this um, clash that seems to be happening at the moment between governments and technology companies. And if you think about the broader context here where there are a lot of uh, te technological races are becoming geopolitical, um, it feels to me like we're not really setting ourselves up for success here. We've got this antagonistic relationship between government and tech companies. Um, and I'm just wondering whether you see a path, an off-ramp there where we can have a more collaborative relationship where governments can work much more closely with um, tech, the tech industry to try and both deal with some of these challenges that we've we've got, and I think everybody agrees on, but just more generally, I think to have a more collaborative relationship in terms of how we go about this, not only with those societal issues that we've got to grapple with, but winning the, the big new races that we're we're confronting at the moment, whether it's our artificial intelligence, you know, deployment of that, uh, quantum computing, you name it. Yeah, gr great point, Fergus. I mean. I I think so. I think there are a number of areas where, um, you know, private companies working with government can do great things, uh, and that the, uh, there's there's no need for it to be antagonistic. You know, for example, one of the things we've worked on over the last year, year and a half, is helping governments provide COVID-related services over WhatsApp. You know, in Australia, the government set up a helpline for people to get accurate information about COVID. We've seen all around the world, you know dozens, if not hundreds, I'm pretty sure hundreds at this point of health agencies or governments providing COVID information, vaccine information, et cetera, all over WhatsApp. We think that kind of thing is great. Um, you know, at the same time, I I personally believe that it, it is incredibly healthy for as a private company for governments to be regulating and pushing private companies. I think that is an important part of the liberal, liberal democratic system. Um, I do think there's areas where we could collaborate on, you know, in what places should private companies be pushed? For example, when it comes to the debate around NN encryption, I, I think a better model would be for government to be pushing private companies to have much higher levels of security protecting people's data. You know, I, I think we should be regulated more strongly to have the strongest possible security not be pushed in the direction of weakening it. Well, let me ask you about that question. So there's this, there's this arc of fragile democracies that runs basically from below Japan across to India. And that's really, to me, in this region, seems to be like it's going to be ground zero for uh, interference from you know, states that want to mess up with that information environment. Um, it's there's they're obviously going through their own growing pains in terms of solidifying you know, democratic institutions and the like. What is the role for a, a company like WhatsApp in that situation? And what, is, what are you seeing in terms of the mega trends of, you know, the, the swing towards democracy or towards authoritarianism in that really important band of countries in this region? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that tech plays an important role in is, um, you know, as tech services are successful all around the world, they encapsulate um, the, the liberal democratic values of the liberal democracies that they come from, either because that's just the culture or because the legal frameworks in those countries require it, incentivize it, encourage it. And I think that's a really good thing. You know, you look at WhatsApp specifically, 
it has made it free um, and secure for 2 billion people to say things to other people that they know. Um, and, and, you know, in, in Australia, in the US, we kind of can make the mistake of taking for granted that I can say something to someone else in private securely without it being eavesdropped on. But that's not true everywhere. You know, the, the, the founder of WhatsApp, Jan Kuhn, you know, he emigrated from this, his family emigrated from the Soviet Union. And, you know, when, he, when, when WhatsApp announced the addition of end to end encryption, he talked about remembering growing up in the Soviet Union when his mother would say, oh, no, that's not a conversation for the phone. That's not a phone conversation. Um, the fact that now 2 billion people around the world in, in, in a range of countries have the ability to say things privately, free from the fear that their government is going to listen to it, is, I think, a very powerful thing in the promotion of human rights, in the promotion of liberal democratic values. Maybe um, that's a good um, off ramp to talk about some of some specifics uh, where you're, you're going to be challenged on that particular issue. So um, if you take the case of Hong Kong, for example, um, you came out really early on to say that you weren't going to collaborate uh, and hand over user data to the authorities when this new law was the national security law was passed there. Um, other companies quickly followed suit there. Um, I, I understand, you know, Facebook, uh, you know, which uh, is the owner of WhatsApp, has got an office there. What, what's the trajectory there for a company like WhatsApp? Can you continue to operate in Hong Kong? Obviously, the, the people in Hong Kong really love the service. I, I think it's going up in terms of users. But what, what's the trajectory there in Hong Kong for, for, for your company? And what do you think is going to happen with other companies there? Well, I mean, you you may be better placed to predict the the overall trajectory in Hong Kong. Um, you know, from my from my perspective, we offer a secure service. Um, I you know, from everything I've heard from people in Hong Kong, and we've heard people there appreciate that they appreciate they know that if I send them, they send a message to someone else, we can't see it, we don't have a copy of it, it's not being monitored, um, and that's our model. And the reality is that. Um, countries choose whether or not to allow that model under their laws. I hope that that will continue to be allowed in Hong Kong. I think it brings great um, economic benefits to people in Hong Kong can communicate with anyone anywhere in the world. Um, but the reality is we, we run the risk of being blocked everywhere we operate. We have at times been blocked in, in mainland China. We've blocked in other countries. Um, you know, we, we're kind of, from our perspective, the thing we do is we offer a secure, reliable service. Um, and we hope that every country will see the benefit in that. But in reality, not everyone does. So there's this, there's this broader um, debate that's happening at the moment around tech bifurcation and whether or not companies are going to have to choose between, you know, whether they stick with the, the democratic West or, or are going to work with an authoritarian China. Um, a company like WhatsApp has, you know, obviously staked out that it's going to preserve, you know, user privacy um, through end-to-end -end encryption and, and not handing over information. Does that bring you into this debate and, and force you to, to stake out a position? And is that something that, you know, you're going to have to, you see being entrenched rather than, than um, being weakened over time? Well, you know, our position is certainly clear. Um, we've staked it out. I actually think this is a, a bigger question than what a, you know, any private company can do or any private technology service can do. I think this is really a, a question for liberal democracies. Um, you know, how much of, uh, what they're focused on, you know, what Australia is focused on, the U.S., et cetera, is exporting those values to all of these other countries. Um, and I, I think tech services are actually uh, um, an asset in that. And that, um, you know, we go back to our point about collaboration or confrontation with governments. Either way, I think governments uh, could push very, very hard on tech services spreading and enabling key values in liberal human rights, liberal democracies and human rights. So another area where you, um, this sort of issue around user privacy has come up is India, um, where you've, if I'm not mistaken, you're taking the Indian government to court at the moment over this issue yes, of uh, traceability. Um, there have been, I think there's been similar proposals in Brazil around traceability. And I'm just wondering, could you tell us what traceability is and what your view is on it? Yeah, absolutely. So. The, the traceability, the, the concept, the request is that we and other messaging services should change how we operate so that a government could come 
to us and say, here is a message that someone on your service sent. We don't know who sent it first, but someone sent it. Please go find out for us who sent it. Search everyone in the country and tell us who sent it. Um, we think that is, it's a very dangerous change to end-to-end -end encryption. Part of the, the, the security benefit that end-to-end -end encryption provides is that we don't keep copies of the messages people send. We don't have ways to reverse the messages that people send. And that provides a security benefit to everyone that they know their messages are not going to be stolen or lost or surveilled. Um, and we think there's real privacy considerations to it being you know, possible for someone to go to a tech company and say, tell me who first said X. Um, so you know, we've been clear about that in India for a number of years. There's been an active debate. Um, with the latest regulations around traceability, we've challenged them in court as being, we believe, inconsistent with the privacy guarantees in the Constitution of India. Um, but more broadly, if you look globally, I think there's these, there's these two debates, one around how do we protect from cybersecurity threats that are growing, be they from hackers or hostile governments. You know, we saw the SolarWinds attack. Um, we, you know, we at WhatsApp saw uh, an attack from the NSO group, a private company. We went public with that uh, a little over a year and a half ago. And the other one around, should we weaken end-to-end -end encryption to solve various purposes? I, I believe the conversations need to be together and that end-to-end -end encryption is an important tool to protect us from the growing cybersecurity threats that are happening all around the world. And what's your what's the re response that you get when you raise this type of position with governments around the world? Are they starting to is this a position that's starting to resonate, or is it a, is it still something that's um, percolating through policy you know processes? You know, it's 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 obviously varied, country by country and region by region. Um, we've had some important milestones and victories. You know, in, in Brazil, for example, it used to be that WhatsApp was blocked pretty frequently over the fact that we don't have access to people's messages to turn over. Um, but in recent years, we've actually had a number of, uh, there've been a number of important court decisions. It's not all done in Brazil, but for example, an appellate court ruled that end encryption was important for protecting human rights, people's human rights in Brazil. Um, but it's mixed. You know, I wish I could tell you that uh, the conversation is all going in one direction. Obviously it's not. Obviously there's real debate about it. And that's one of the reasons why I was excited to you know speak about it here in Australia is I think this is really, really important for our future. I think we need a secure internet for liberal democracies. Um, and I, I get very worried about any suggestion that we weaken that um, because I think the long-term consequences of that will be grave. Um, just back to India. I mean, there's a lot of news coming out of India at the moment around its, you know, different actions that it's taking in relation to technology companies, you know, not just US companies, Chinese companies, other companies internet shutdowns. What's your view at the moment about what, what the dynamics are in India? Um, what, what's going on there? You know, what, what do you think is going to be the trajectory for a company like WhatsApp with you know over 400 million users or so there? Yeah. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of different issues. I think you, know, you are right that um, one thing we look very closely at is proposals or changes that would weaken security, that would require the collection of more data on people who use our services that would, you know, involve requests to turn over data. Um, we follow rigorous processes there and hold things to high international human rights standards. Um, but I hope the trajectory is a positive one. You know, we have more than 400 million uh, users of WhatsApp in India. That is growing. India is growing. The economy is growing. Um, there is so much opportunity over the next, you know, number of years, decade plus. And we'd like to play a small part of that. For example, you know, one of the things we've uh, been able to bring to India and launch, the first place we launched anywhere in the world is payments on WhatsApp. WhatsApp made sending a message or calling someone free and secure. What if we can help make financial services free and secure for everyone? In many of the countries we operate in, there's actually more people who use WhatsApp than have access to financial services, um, have, that have a bank account. And so in places like India, we're hopeful we can be part of the economic growth story. I'm just reading through the, some of the questions that are coming through. There's some yeah. um, good ones coming up. Um, just just a couple, couple more from me on the end-to-end -end encryption issue. It's it's obviously this hot button issue that uh, for governments it, or lots of governments at the moment. Can you walk us through what drove you, the drivers that drove you to implement end-to-end -end encryption on WhatsApp? Yeah, WhatsApp has always believed deeply 
in offering a secure service. Uh, and so I think you know the core driver is as security gets better, as there's more new, stronger security technologies, we're going to implement them because we are uh, designing the service in a way to pe protect people's private uh, communication. You know, what are the drivers of that? It comes from a deep-seated belief that human beings should be able to say something to someone else in private, in confidence, without someone listening in. Um, and that goes, you know, whether you whether you came from a place like the Soviet Union, or you have a background where you've come from an authoritarian regime, or you're just someone who's, you know, thinking about the future. And as we build a more digital technological world, are we going to keep the ability that we've had as human beings for hundreds of years to just say things to each other in private without a company looking at it, without a government looking at it? We believe you should we should keep that. We do not think that as the world digitizes, we should give up such a fundamental aspect of our privacy. And, and so on that, is, is this sort of a, um, a false debate that we're having then to say, well, if it's end-to-end -end encryption, then we're allowing crime to take place on these platforms. Is there, in fact, a, a, a different pathway here where there still can be co cooperation with law enforcement that doesn't mean opening up everyone's private messages? Um, is that the case or is it a sort of a black and white situation that it's either secure communications or, you know, uh, and crime or, you know, one or the other. I don't think it's a black and white situation at all. I think we absolutely can have security and safety for people through end-to-end -end encryption and work with law enforcement to solve crimes through proper legal process with the information we have and proactively do things. You know, we, you know, a lot of the debate, for example, has been around child safety and the sharing of child exploitative imagery. We are by far the industry leaders in finding and detecting that behavior in an end-to-end -end encrypted service. We reported more than 400,000 cases last year of child exploitative imagery to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. For comparison, some of the other end-to-end -end encrypted services have reported none. I think all of Apple as a company reported 256 total cases. We have 400,000. I think there is a lot we can do, but we just believe it starts from recognizing that end-to-end -end encryption is a necessary security technology today and important. And we should have that as a baseline level of protection and then do other things on top of it. Maybe just on that, because it's, it is such a, um, a hot, a, you know, an issue that is constantly raised by law enforcement as one of the things that they, they want to stop um, because, you know, the, the, the line goes that end-to-end -end encryption is enabling this type of exploitation to occur. Can you walk people through how it is that you can provide that kind of information to authorities on child exploitation while at the same time not breaking into end encryption? Absolutely. So we don't see people's private messages. They're end-to-end -end encrypted, but there's other information we have. A, a very straightforward one is we make it possible for people to report inside WhatsApp if they see a message that is inappropriate or harassing or illegal or spam. You know, you and I should be able to talk privately without sharing that. And, but if you want, if I say something and you want to report it to someone, you should be able to. So we get those reports, we scan them proactively using the best technology. On top of that, we have other aspects of information that's not the content of your messages. What groups are you in? What's the name of the group? What's the profile photo? Are there patterns of behavior? And between those types of approaches, we're able to, to ban millions of accounts a month for inappropriate behavior. We're able to make reports. And when law enforcement, you know, again, following proper legal process and subject, you know, all around the world, subject to human rights standards, we're able to provide the information we do have to law enforcement and they use it to solve crimes. One other question around this is, could you could you tell us how safety is different on public communication services versus private communication services? Yeah, absolutely. We, th we, th we think it's very different because you have to think of the context on WhatsApp of you're, you're talking in a very small group, actually over 90% of the conversations are just one-to-one. -one. And so the types of um, issues that you might have on a large public social network and the types of solutions you might look at on a large public social network aren't appropriate for private messaging. You know, it, it, it's appropriate on a large public social network that if someone posts something that's false and thousands of people are going to see it, um, for that to potentially trigger a fact check warning or some information on that. It's not on WhatsApp. If I call my mom and I say something on the phone, it's not appropriate for a, a robot to listen in and tell me something. How we've approached the problem is by looking at how can we change the design of the product to focus on private communication and not the mass spread of information. For example, it used to be possible to, if you saw a message on WhatsApp, 
to forward it to all of the threads on WhatsApp. We changed that and took it away and said you could only forward it to five, up to five threads at once. That dropped forwards by 25% globally overnight. Um, then at the, around the time of the start of COVID, we added functionality where if a message has been forwarded multiple times, we label it differently in the app and you're only allowed to forward it to one thread at a time. And that caused those highly forwarded messages to drop by over the majority of them went away. I think two thirds of them went away. And more recently, we've been working on um, uh, functionality around helping users access accurate information more easily than they can spread it. So in a number of countries now, in a number of languages, the quick forward button is gone on highly forwarded messages. It's been replaced with a Google button. And the idea is you can go Google the message. The easiest thing you can do is Google the message you got and find out if it's accurate or not, um, rather than go forward it onto someone else. So we think those kinds of product changes, design changes in the product are more appropriate for a, a private network uh, where people are really communicating with each other, mostly one-to-one. -one. Thank you. I'm, I'm just going to have a, a couple more around, um, I'll ask you a couple of questions on misinformation um, and, and disinformation. So WhatsApp's been, um, you, obviously this is a, a huge issue for countries all around the world. We've seen, um, accusations around disinformation being spread in the Brazilian um, election in 2018. We've had misinformation around coronavirus is obviously a global discussion right now. I'm just wondering what is the, the role of, what are the changes that you've made at WhatsApp beyond, you know, you mentioned some of them then around spreading virality, but what kind of effect have they had in terms of what, what you've seen in terms of the information environment that's been um, produced as a result of that? I mean, it's probably yeah. hard to say, you know, what, what didn't happen, but um, can you talk a little bit about how you, what the impact you think that, that those measures have had? Yeah, absolutely. And of course it's hard because again, we, we can't look at people's messages. We don't have them. Um, but yeah, there's the changes I mentioned. So we've made a, a number of design changes around forwarding, we've seen large decreases in how much forwarding is happening across the system. You know, specifically around um, electoral issues as well, you know, one of the things that had been happening was there were reports of people creating lots of fake WhatsApp accounts to try and put out, push out misinformation. Well, we've, over the last few years, significantly ramped up our capability to detect cases where people are creating lots of uh, fake or inauthentic accounts and automatically ban them. You know, we now ban millions of accounts a month proactively. And that's had a huge shift in the ability for people to go and set up kind of an information farm and pump out information and try to do that over messaging. We've also around elections been working with electoral authorities in various countries, including Brazil, you know, where in the more recent elections, we've partnered with them. We've understood, you know, what positive information can we help put out fact, you know, be it fact check services with news organizations, electoral information from electoral services. Also, as they, as they find instances of information, misinformation, disinformation, you know, relaying that to us so we can shut down accounts, et cetera. And then lastly, we've, you know, we've, we've done work on public education. How can we help educate people around the literacy of if you see a rumor, should you share it um, or should you question it? And I think when you look at all of those, you know, it's, I would never say we've achieved 100% success and I would never promise that that will continue forever because this is an adversarial space. But if you look at the more recent elections in places like Brazil, um, I, I think there's been a huge change in, in people's estimate of what WhatsApp's role was in the information environment compared to what it was years before. I'll just ask one final question before I hand over to um, these, these great questions that people are sending through and please um, continue to send through the, the questions and vote up each other's uh, questions as you go along. Um, but we'll, you've, you've talked about the role of WhatsApp, you're a messaging platform getting into geopolitics, um, taking you know, the, some of the most populous countries in the world to court, uh, having a role in educating people around the world. It's, it's taken you into all of these different uh, sectors that maybe you know, were never really envisaged when the, the platform was created. I'm just wondering, we're having this debate here in Australia around whether you can bake in safety uh, by design into to new technologies before they're even created. Is it even possible to to envisage um, what you know how your platform's going to be used in the future when you're design when you're designing and building it? So can you bake in those kind of safety features before you start, or is it a case that you know 
there's going to be a constant evolution of people trying to misuse your platform or use it for different purposes that you could never have anticipated and you just have to add, be agile in responding to that as you go along. I think it's both. I do not think you can predict every way in which people will use a new technology, especially as it achieves scale. And I do not believe you can predict every way in which an adversary will try to exploit it. But I think you should try. Um, and we certainly try as we as we develop improvements to WhatsApp, you know, all across Facebook, we try to understand how might this be used, how might it be misused. Let's anticipate that as best we can um, up front in the design. But then once it's out there, you need to stay on top of how is your service being used uh, and change over time. Because the reality is how people use services change and you know, on, in many unpredictable ways. And how people misuse services is obviously impossible to predict completely given how adversarial it is. So I think the answer has to be both. Great, well, I'm gonna turn now to some of the questions that have come in from folks. Uh, and we've got a quite, a, quite a lot here. So um, excuse me while I'm back and forth reading these through, but I'm gonna start with a question from um, James Kell, who said, end-to-end -end encryption is good for most people, yet it also enables crime. What are WhatsApp's responsibilities there? Well, First of all, as I talked about before, we believe end-to-end -end encryption is an important security and safety benefit. It also combats crime. You know, one of the top things we hear about from people, and it shows up in survey after survey, is that they're worried about their personal information being stolen. And we think it's important that people have secure technology. Um, and you know, not just for messaging, but encryption protects your bank information when you, when you use your banking services online, when you purchase things online. You can only do that because it's secure through encryption. We certainly think we have a responsibility to do everything we can above and beyond providing a secure service to mitigate uh, any bad cases, to proactively work with them, and of course, to work with law enforcement um, when, uh, when, when they follow proper legal process with the information we have. Um, you know, I think sometimes we, we fall into the, um, the trap of thinking about digital spaces a little differently than physical spaces. In physical spaces, we've always understood, I think, that there should be a limit to how much we do to be able to collect information to solve crimes, even if it would help in solving some crimes. You know, we're, we're, we're heading towards a world where lots of people are gonna have smart devices in their home. They're gonna have screens and cameras. I do not believe we should build those devices in such a way that every camera is connected to the internet, accessible to the police to access them whenever there's a, a case. I don't think the police should be able to turn on a camera in, your, in any, any living room in the country whenever they, whenever they have it, something they're investigating. Doing so may solve some crimes. But I think the idea that we would all have cameras in our living rooms that the police could look at is horrifying to most people. I think in digital spaces, it sometimes feel diff feels different, but it shouldn't. I don't think it should be possible to, uh, to, to have a central company or a government access any conversation between anyone amongst billions of people in the world. Um, are there gonna be some cases where you might've been able to solve a crime if you could? Of course, um, but there's also gonna be other crimes that are created if you do something, and there's other huge privacy issues and issues for human rights and liberal uh, democratic values that would undermine if you did something like that. Yeah, I think we don't have to look uh, too far afield to see what lengths you can go to in terms of installing cameras all over the place and monitoring people 24 hours to, you know, what type of world we live in there. Exactly, or in the case of messaging. You know, WeChat, it's not end-to-end -end encrypted. Messages are monitored. There's plenty of examples of people trying to spread valuable, truthful information and being told by the government that that's not true or that's not allowed and getting in trouble for it. There is a different model out there. It's very clear and I think it is the wrong one. Well, this might pivot to a question that's come from, um, from Joe. Uh, WhatsApp sees user privacy is extremely important. What about user safety and protection of vulnerable users? What is WhatsApp's view on its responsibilities in this regard? We, we view this as core to what we do. Um, and so that's why we do all of the safety work, you know, the bit of which I talked about before. We are industry leaders by far in developing safety solutions in an end-to-end -end encrypted environment. It's why we believe in the importance of end-to-end -end encryption. We have a lot of people using WhatsApp in parts of the world that are not safe, do not have the liberal democratic values of Australia, that are scary places. And we hear from people over and over and over again that knowing that their messages aren't being stored somewhere, can't be read, can't be accessed remotely is really important to people and other safety benefits. For example, we let people share, we have a feature where you can share your location, your current location or your live location with someone else. It's entirely end -end encrypted. it's totally secure, only the other person can see it. People knowing that we don't have a copy of their location is a huge safety benefit 
for, for users uh, in those situations. And the feature is really valuable. People, for example, all the time will share their location with a spouse or a friend. Um, you know, if you're taking a taxi and you're scared for your safety, share your information. So we think the core product is important for this. And the fact that it's secure is incredibly important. Um, I'm going to ask you the question I think has had the, the most votes, and I think it gets to this idea of this debate here around what's the trade-off with a with using a free product. Um, so Jordan has asked, how does WhatsApp make money, i.e. what value does Facebook get from WhatsApp? Great question, Jordan. The short answer is we don't make anywhere near as much money as it costs to develop uh, and operate WhatsApp. We hope to in the future. Um, the, 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 the way we hope to make money in the future is that by having a great free service that consumers love and use, um, we're increasingly finding that some consumers choose to message businesses. You know, I don't know about you, but you know, when was the last time you had to call a business and wait on hold uh, on the phone for a call center? It's a horrible experience. Or you have to go to a website and it's really slow and complicated. Well, if you can just message a business and get an answer back from them, people prefer that. And it's better for businesses because it's, it's actually lower cost for them and they have happier customers. And so we now have over 50 million businesses who use the WhatsApp small business app, as well as a number of businesses that use our, our API for large businesses. So for example, if you wanna get a boarding pass from an airline, you can have it texted to WhatsApp. If you wanna, you know, in a number of countries, get information on a vaccine or go book your vaccine, you can just message on WhatsApp and get the vaccine appointment rather than having to call a phone line. And we generate revenue from that in two ways. One is we charge the large businesses for that integration. So if you're doing customer service with an airline or getting boarding passes, we charge the business free for the consumer, charge for the business. And the second is those 50 million plus small businesses. One of the top things we hear from them is that they would love to have a way to find new customers. So we actually encourage them to go try advertising on Facebook or Instagram, not ads on WhatsApp, but ads on Facebook or Instagram. And those new businesses that are new to the internet and new to advertising, uh, finding out about Facebook advertising obviously generates revenue as well. So we hope that those two over the long run will give us a model that means it's a free product cons for consumers, it's secure, it has the expectations you want from private messaging, and it means that we're generating revenue to run the service as businesses find it valuable. Thanks, Will. Um, this is another uh, question that's been uh, upvoted. It's a slightly technical one, but it's, um, uh, I think getting to um, where you're headed with the plat with the platform is end-to-end -end encryption the end point, uh, or will emerging technologies like homomorphic encryption be implemented? As this can now allow analysis on encrypted info, which can benefit law enforcement to detect uh, child sexual abuse material, but also benefit companies with advertising. Yeah, I don't believe end-to-end -end encryption is the end point. I think the reality is that we are in a arms race for security on the internet. The threats are growing by the year. They get worse. Um, they're not just hackers. They're hostile governments. They're scary. And so I think security will need to continue to evolve and get better. And you know, at WhatsApp, we will keep adding security technology as it becomes available or as we come up with it. Uh, you know, on there's sometimes talk about these things like homomorphic encryption or or or, or different ways to 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 find a you know a, a magic solution that will both keep people's content so secure but allow law enforcement or companies to access it. Um, there's technical problems with a lot of those things that are out there now, but, but, but stepping back from that and just thinking about the trend of technology, I'd be wary of things that say, hey, we can see all the messages just in the good cases, but we won't have a way to see all the messages in the bad. Um, the reality is, is that's usually not how technology works. Either you can see messages or you can't. Maybe there'll be some innovative solution, but I'd be a little skeptical of it. But overall, we're just going to keep adding more security as we see threats continue to grow. Uh, we've got another question here from Ben, which says, um, why does Facebook have a policy of content removal for groups like ISIS or the Russian IRA or Russia's IRA, yet uh, WhatsApp's private encrypted conversations theoretically enable those same actors to potentially plan or execute activities? How is this contrast internally viewed from a policy perspective? Yeah, well, at a high level, I mean, to be super clear, we also have policies against people like ISIS using WhatsApp. We do a lot of sophisticated behind the scenes work with the information that we have to detect uh, and deactivate and prevent use like that. 
Um, for example, looking at information like profile names, profile photos, group names, group photos, patterns of behavior, patterns of groups that people are in. So we are reports that we get from users. Um, so don't want to leave you with the impression that, that we don't. But zooming out, I think the fact that there are some policy differences makes sense, given that talking to thousands of people in a large public space is different and has, has always been viewed as different than talking to people privately in one-to-one. -one. You know, what I'm allowed to call Fergus on the phone and say to him privately um, is different than whether I go publish something on the internet for thousands of people to see. And our policies, of course, reflect that, as does the, the security and the privacy that we offer. We think it's important that private messages be very secure and unencrypted and that we should have a copy of it. That's different than whether if you post something on Facebook for everyone to see, we should have a copy of it. We've got a question here from um, Peter and he's asking whether you can explain metadata. How does this affect our security? Great question. So met metadata, it's, it's really a term for information that's not the content of your messages and what it is can range, right? So if you use WhatsApp, the IP address that you're using WhatsApp is metadata, but also the, the context that you have um, or potentially even who you've messaged could be metadata. Um, we don't, uh, it, it, across the board in the normal course of business, keep copies of everyone of who you're messaging ourselves, but that's the kind of thing that's metadata. And from a, from a safety or security perspective, you can imagine law enforcement through proper process, getting access to that information. You know, we know this phone number, we, it was, was doing something. We need to know where it was. We can access the IP address through a proper court process and use that to go investigate the case further. And we can use it ourselves in some of the proactive safety work we do, like that I talked about earlier. Great, thank you. Um, we've got a question here around um, the privacy uh, changes that WhatsApp announced recently and the, um, the sharing of user data with um, uh, Facebook, with parent company Facebook. Uh, I'm just, and there was talking, so Miguel has said many WhatsApp users have switched to rival server signal. Uh, after this uh, policy switch, does WhatsApp believe it has assuaged uh, user concerns? Well, it, I think the reality is people have multiple messaging apps on their phone and they use a lot of them. And every day we're in a competition for people to choose our service over others. Um, I, I think we've come a long way in assuaging people's concerns. But for the sake of clarity, let me just say it here for everyone else, or, or for everyone here, our policy, privacy policy update did not change anything about the privacy of your personal conversations and did it not change anything about the rights we have under our policy to share information with Facebook. Um, what it did was two things. One, it had a number of uh, transparency and legal updates to our policy, which hadn't been updated in a while. It did not change anything about sharing. And two, it described some new business features we're going to be offering, including the ability for businesses, large businesses that want to, to store messages in the cloud um, potentially with Facebook as one of the options, though they'll have other choices. Um, that's a new thing about when you're messaging a really large business. So those were the two things that the update did. It did not change anything about the privacy of your personal conversations, and it did not uh, change anything about our ability to share data with Facebook. Um, clearly, we heard a lot of concern. Clearly, we heard a lot of confusion. It's our job to communicate this stuff clearly. So we've taken that confusion and tried to do our best to communicate clearly. I think we've made a lot of progress on that. We've seen the overwhelming majority of people go in and choose to accept the new update. Um, we continue to see WhatsApp grow, um, but we're in a competition for people's trust. We're in a competition for people wanting to us as, choosing us as the messaging app that works the best for them. Um, so we'll continue to be really clear about our values, really clear about what we're doing and make WhatsApp better. Great. Um, we had a, a question from Kate, and it's in relation to um, you know these these arguments that are put up by law enforcement. So she says. How do you answer law enforcement's position that if a court grants them lawful access to people's private communications through a warrant and you know, the, the, the right process, uh, that law enforcement should be able to read their encrypted messages? Yeah, of course, it's very simple. We believe that law enforcement working at the right process should have access to the information that we have. And that's why we work with law enforcement and we provide that information. We do not believe that we should intentionally weaken the security of WhatsApp and go keep a copy of everyone's messages, which is what would be required for them to be able to come with a, with a warrant and, or, or through proper process and have us give over people's messages. We don't think people want WhatsApp keeping a copy of everyone's messages all around the world. 
We don't think that's the right thing to do. And we think that work weakens security. And you know, to the to the broader point about should we um, should we accept trade-offs to do that? I think as a society, we've always understood that there are trade-offs in what how we build our security systems, where we draw privacy lines. And the answer isn't always we should do everything possible to give police access to 110% of the information out there. We shouldn't put a camera in everyone's living room so that the police can watch when they have a case. Would help solve some crimes, would make us less safe, and would be a very, very scary experience. And we feel the same way about messaging. We don't think we should change it so we have a copy of everyone's messages. We've got a, um, a follow-up here from uh, Still Gary, and who's, uh, it's a follow-up to Jordan's question about um, how, face, how WhatsApp um, makes money. And he said, um, are you able to talk about um, the current revenue where the majority of that comes, comes from? Do you have a, a few examples that could illustrate the, the sort of model at the moment? Yeah, it's, it's the two examples. Great question. It's the two examples I talked about, which is uh, businesses that use WhatsApp choosing to run ads on Facebook or Instagram. And specifically to go in more detail, um, there are at, you can run an ad on Facebook that points to a website. You can run an ad on Facebook that points, gives out your phone number. Or now you can run an ad on, on Facebook where the button says message me on WhatsApp. And this is better for consumers because they prefer to talk to businesses over WhatsApp. It's better for the business because it performs better. And it means Facebook generates more revenue. Of the two, we make more money from that. And then the second one, which uh, is, is growing very quickly, is for large businesses, when they use our API to integrate, they pay us a fee per conversation that happens. So those two are where the revenue comes from. Um, so it's, they're not just examples, they are where the revenue comes from. Um, we've got a, uh, a question here about um, scaling and and, um, and government regulation. So um, Thomas has said, how does WhatsApp think about scaling in an era where countries are increasingly regulating technologies in their own ways? Will this impact future innovation? Potentially, I mean, I you know, I think as we talked about before, I, I think there's nothing wrong. I actually think it's a great model the in, 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 in liberal democracy is that governments regulate companies. I think that's really, really helpful and healthy. And as you know, as a consumer and a citizen, I love that. What the regulations are obviously matter. You know, we've been talking a lot about um, the debate around and regulations around backdoors to NN encryption. I would love to see more examples of governments regulating us to have to provide stronger security, to have to do more around data protection. Um, but yeah, I mean, obviously the, the reality depends on the specific regulation. Um, and of course, you know, we, we, we have opinions and thoughts and can go into any you know, specific area if it's helpful for people if people do want to hear our opinion, but if they do, but, um, but broadly, I think it really just depends. Um, we've got a question here from um, AIM, who I, I assume may be an academic. Um, the question is, how can WhatsApp better collaborate with the academic community in advancing research on WhatsApp itself? That's a great question. And, you know, maybe I'd even turn that around to you, which we would love to hear more from academics about, you know, what we could be doing to help with academic research. Um, you know, one area that we've we've been paying a lot of attention to, obviously, over the last few years is misinformation. Um, and one of I didn't talk about it before, but one of the things we've done there is work uh, with partners. There's been more journalistic institutions, but it could be academics as well to offer fact check lines. So if I see something in WhatsApp, can I forward it on to a number uh, and then get, find out whether or not what was said was true or false. Obviously not everyone's gonna do that. Not everyone's gonna forward something they get onto a fact check line, but that can be a powerful source of research. I think that for example, there might be really interesting opportunities to understand what kinds of misinformation or misunderstandings are people saying privately to each other by having some people forward those on. And could you do research on that and understand the information ecosystem? And could that shape our public messaging be it around health or elections or other topics to the community at large through other channels, through mass media? by better understanding what people are saying privately. Again, without our ability, needing to be able to see anyone's messages without changing anyone's privacy expectations. Um, we've got a question around some um, staffing from Melissa, but it, it fed into a question that I, I didn't get to answer, ask early on. So I might ask a, a couple around this. Um, you're now a company with over 2 billion users uh, globally. Um, you know, a quarter of the world's population. If you compare that with a, you know, a large technology, a large, um, telecommunications company that might be, you know, a quarter of a million staff. What's the, the staffing footprint of a, a company like WhatsApp? 
And Melissa has specifically asked, how many staff does WhatsApp have for investigations of user reports? Yeah, I guess, I mean, overall, you know, I think if you're comparing with the hundreds of thousands model from before, it is smaller than that. Um, the reality of the in internet and the technological infrastructure of it is you can create these things with very small teams and support them at first with very small teams. So there's messaging startups that are, you know, single digits of people. We've scaled to be bigger than that. Um, you know, there's not, there's, there's a lot of people across Facebook who help with WhatsApp, but I think if you look at people who, who work kind of full-time on WhatsApp, it's, it's above a thousand. Um, you know, won't get into the full breakdown on customer service, user reports, engineering, et cetera, but it's a lot of that. Um, and I think, um, you know, I think the reality is we can scale the service very quickly, but we have a lot of work we need to do to improve it for people. A lot of work to do the proactive safety work I talked about and work to, you know, react to user reports and be able to help. So that's what drives the increase over a small startup, which is a few people. Great. Um, Judy's asked, um, with the, the growing ability of inauthentic accounts to act like authentic accounts, how can WhatsApp prevent disinformation uh, into the future? Yeah, I mean, the, the, we've done a lot of work on, on detecting inauthentic accounts. You know, keep in mind when you sign up for WhatsApp, you need to provide a phone number, you need to verify that phone number. So when they're, you know, that, that's a barrier right there, but there are people out there who will go buy in bulk lots of phone numbers. And we use a lot of sophisticated techniques with the data we do have to detect that and ban it. And I think that's a really important part of the story is we, we actually do, and it's a bit of a cat and mouse game, but we need to do the work and we've made a lot of progress on it. That's why we ban millions of accounts a month. We need to do the work to detect that and make it very, very hard for someone to go create a lot of accounts. That combined with the design changes we've made to WhatsApp, so it's not a place where you can easily forward information on to everyone all at once, combined makes it a much harder, um, I think, surface for disinformation attackers to go after. Um, I've got a question here from um, William, and he said, um, I'm, I'm going to sort of have to interpret this one a little bit because I think he's not meaning. The question is, what futures, uh, future features, uh, sorry, what future features are you able to envisage and describe? And, and where's the trajectory, I, I suppose, for WhatsApp, given that the evolution that you've already gone on uh, as a company so far over uh, just over a decade, where do you see it going if you look out, say, the next, you know, the next decade? Yeah. Well, we think there's a long way from where we are to replicating a face-to-face -face conversation. Our dream with WhatsApp is that it is just as easy to have a conversation with someone else over WhatsApp as it would be in person. And we all know how far away we are from that. I mean, this year, having to have conversations over, you know, be it over WhatsApp or Zoom or, or any of the other services, we know how far apart it is. So we think there's a lot of improvements we can make to WhatsApp. A couple examples I'll give you. One is um, if, if you and I have a conversation in person, we don't usually keep permanent transcripts of the conversation. You know, end-to-end -end encryption helps solve the problem. We don't usually have someone eavesdropping on the conversation, but with messaging services, you still kind of keep a record. So we're adding a lot of functionality around letting you send messages that don't live forever. In WhatsApp, you can now set a thread to have everything go away every after seven days because you don't want to keep a permanent record. We're going to be soon adding the ability for you to send a photo. Maybe you're sending your credit card info or bank information. Send a photo that the other person can only view once and then it automatically goes away. Things like that over time. Another area is calling. We've been working hard over the last year to make video calling better. Not surprisingly, video calling grew very quickly on WhatsApp this last year as people turned to it to talk to people when they couldn't be in person. So we're supporting more people. We've made a number of quality improvements. We added desktop calling recently for one-to-one -one calls. Would love to support it for group calls. Um, and then the last area I'll point to is payments. You know, we, we now have payments live in India and Brazil. Um, and the idea is just as WhatsApp revolutionized communication by making it free and secure to talk to someone, can we do the same thing for financial services and make it so that if you're sending money, maybe you're an expatriate and you're sending money home to your country, can you send that home for free or cheaply rather than for a really, really expensive fee, which is how it works for a lot of people today. Great, thank you, Will. Um, I might just ask one question just to wrap up. Um, one of the fascinating things I found my own personal experience with WhatsApp is I was back in the days when we were allowed to travel um, and I went to Argentina, um, everybody started sending me messages. Instead of text, I was getting voice memos and you were constantly holding your phone up to your head trying to you know, listen to everyone's voice memos. Do you see a, a sort of the full spectrum of human um, 
differences um, reflected in is there is there very wide differences in usage that you see between one country and the other and age groups is it the whole panoply of uh, human difference uh, reflected on the platform there absolutely are i love this question not everyone realizes this unless you've seen it but voice memos are incredibly popular on whatsapp um bi billions of them are sent every single day and it, it gets to the the idea of the differences in all of our experiences. You know, a lot, of, a lot of people who use WhatsApp have never used a desktop computer before. A lot of people who use WhatsApp use it in a language that's hard to type on, on your phone. A lot of people who use WhatsApp, a surprising number of people who use WhatsApp aren't fully literate. Um, and so the ability to just quickly and easily send a voice memo um, rather than try to type something out, if you've never used a computing device before, is really, really, really powerful. And so, yeah, we absolutely see that variation all around the world. It's a lot of what gets me and the team excited as we go talk to people in different parts of the world who use WhatsApp and learn from them how they do it and what we can do to make it better. Um, and that's what drives a lot of the improvements we work on. Well, I'm going to um, draw to a close there. I want to thank everybody for um, the incredible number of questions you sent through. Uh, it was it was great to have uh, your engagement in this. And Will, I wanted to, to thank you especially for, for taking the time to, to speak with us today to answer so many questions and to, to cover such a, a massive spectrum of issues. Now, Fergus, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you to ASPI. And everyone, thank you for tuning in. I know it took time out of your workday to join and ask all these wonderful, great questions. Thank you.